Hello everyone, my name is Jim, and today we're going to do part two of our DFMA training. If you've not yet seen part one, the link is down in the description. We're going to begin by reviewing what is turning, and then going into DFM for turning. So turning is the process of creating a round part using a stationary tool, while the workpiece rotates. Turning is usually done on a lathe, or a turning center. Don't call turning lathing, or everyone in the shop will laugh at you. Now you notice there's a lot of asterisks all over this slide. Turning has been one of the areas of manufacturing that has seen a lot of development in the last few years. It no longer necessarily makes round parts, necessarily uses a stationary tool, and the workpiece doesn't always rotate. In general though, and for what the team does, you can always just assume that we're using turning to create round parts with a stationary tool. As you can see from this overly complicated diagram, there's a lot of different styles of turning tools, and each one can do a slightly different thing on a part. Don't worry if it seems overwhelming, there's an easy to understand naming scheme that'll help you to identify each of these and which one is best for your application. Before we get into that though, let's talk about the anatomy of a modern turning tool. Most modern turning tools use carbide. Carbide is a great material for cutting since it keeps a very sharp edge, it's very hard, and it dissipates heat very well. However, it's extremely brittle. You can't make an entire tool out of carbide for turning. That's where composite tooling comes in. In composite tooling, the tool holder is made out of steel, and only the bit that's actually in contact with the material is made out of carbide. In these example tools below, the black is all steel for the tool holder, and only the gold is made of carbide. The two are fastened together using a mechanical fastener, such as a screw or a clamp. There is also composite tooling, where the carbide is brazed onto a piece of steel, and both must be uh, thrown out once the tool is broken. You choose the tool style you need based on the part and what you want to cut. The Engineer's Black Book is a great resource to read up on what each of these different styles of tool holders mean and what they're able to cut. The insert is the piece of the tool that is made of carbide and what actually comes in contact with the material. Inserts are identified with a standard letter code. The first five letters of that code determine what style of tool holder it'll fit into. Any inserts that have the same five letter code will fit into the same tool holder. So if you look below, we have CNMG4 inserts, but one is optimized for steel and one is optimized for aluminum. Both of these would work in the MCGNL16 tool holder shown below. This is also a good spot to stop and take a look exactly at the anatomy of the insert. You'll notice that with these square inserts, they have eight corners that are all equal. These inserts can be flipped and rotated, and all eight of those corners can be used as cutting surfaces, therefore reducing the cost. Some other inserts might only have four, three, two, or one cutting edge that can be used. Tool holders also follow a standard letter code that tell you what insert shape and size they can hold, as well as things like the angle of the holder, the clamping method, and how long it is. It's slightly more complex than the inserts code, but it's the same idea and can also be found in the engineer's black book. Let's now look at the anatomy of an actual lathe. Picture to the right is the SWI TRL CNC tool room lathe. This is the most common lathe on the RIT campus, and you'll probably recognize it if you took Mechie 104 in the machine shop. While we'll be looking at this one specifically, most lathes have the same or similar parts in the same or similar locations. First, let's focus on what's inside the lathe. To the far left, we have the spindle nose, where the chuck or whatever other work holding we would be using is situated. The spindle is the part of the lathe that spins, and then through the chuck or work holding, transfers that rotation to your workpiece. Chucks are the most common work holding you're going to see. They secure the stock by clamping down on all sides of the part with equal pressure. It's the same concept to how a drill holds onto any size of drill bit. Different styles of chucks can hold different shapes of stock. 
Three jaw is the most common since it can hold round and hexagonal stock, or any stock that has a multiple of three for its number of faces. If you had, for example, square stock that you needed to hold on to and machine, you'd have to do it in a four or two jaw chuck. Three jaw chucks are also usually self-centering, so the stock is always aligned with the center of the spindle, whereas something like a four jaw chuck, you need to dial it in to get it in the center line. Collets are the other common form of work holding. Collets provide better clamping with less pressure on the part, making them ideal for things that are fragile or you don't want to damage the surface finish. Collets also close much faster and more consistently than chucks, meaning that you can have a faster cycle time making multiple parts. The downside is that collets only work for a small range of diameters and only work for perfectly round stock. For example, if you wanted to cover all parts from 0 to 1 inches in diameter, it would take more than 60 ER collets. Collets can also be very expensive, especially if you need to buy this many. The next part of the lathe we're going to look at is the cross and top slide. These are the parts that move the tool relative to the spindle. The top slide, also sometimes called the compound, is the one that moves in the x-axis. This would be towards or away from us in the picture. The cross slide, also called the saddle, is what moves in the z-axis. This would be to the right and left in this picture. When you're turning, z0 is always towards the spindle, and x0 is always towards the center of the part. So if this cross and top slide started moving towards us and to the right, we'd be moving in positive x and positive z. The tool post is what connects the, the tool to the top and cross slide assembly. Most modern tool posts are quick change. The tools are set in a holder with screw down clamps and then use a dovetail or cam to secure to the tool post. This allows us to have four, five, or six tools already set up and ready to go that we can then change out quickly and keep their positioning accurately. The tail stock is used to drill holes or support larger workpieces. The tail stock doubles the maximum effective length that you can machine. The tail stock requires a hole to be drilled into the back of each part that it supports. You can sometimes see these holes on manufactured products. They're called reference marks. The top and cross slide are usually moved using the X and Z handles on the lathe. Most lathes, the handle will just be connected to a physical bolt, which then has a half nut on the top and cross slide that allows it to move. This specific lathe uses servos, so you can't feel as you're moving the hand wheels the axes actually moving. However, just like with the mill, you can only move one axis at a time. This means that all your cuts must be in line with the X or Z axis. There can't be any curves or arcs. Some machines can have an angled top slide that allows them to cut tapers or other geometry like that. In general, though, you're going to need CNC functionality for anything more complex. Luckily, all of the Prototrack lathes come with CNC conversational computer coding. This allows us to input the general shape that we want and the machine will take over and move the top and cross slide for us automatically. The downside is that programming this is very complex. It's best to design parts that can be manually turned if possible. Just in case you're ever making something very large or very complex and you want to see if it'll actually fit onto the lathe, let's quickly go over how you quantify one. A lathe's capacity is measured in swing and distance between centers. Swing is two times the distance between the top slide and the center of the spindle. It's the largest diameter workpiece that can be machined. The distance between the centers is the absolute longest piece of material you can fit between the spindle and the tailstock. Keep in mind this is the theoretical limit. It doesn't account for things like your chuck or anything else that goes between the spindle and your workpiece. So in review, Potential geometry cut by the lathe is based on the tool being used. Lathe tools are made of an insert and a tool holder, and multiple varieties of insert fit in a single holder for different materials or applications. In addition, certain inserts can be used multiple times by rotating or flipping them. 
A chuck or collet workholding both have advantages and disadvantages based on their applications. And lathes come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes with different capabilities. Let's now look at tool reach and tool orientation, two critical things to consider when manufacturing. Based on the design of the tool, not all tools can cut all geometry. Let's take this part to the right. This is a top-down view of a curve that we're going to make into a vase. Let's try to cut this with the CNMG on the right and VNMT tool on the left and see what we get. As you can see, the VNMT tool was able to cut the entire curve, whereas the CNMG gave up only after a little while. Now why is this? To get into the steeper sections of this part, we needed a steeper tool. So why not just always use a steep tool like the VNMT? The challenge is that these pointier inserts break faster, cut slower, and are much more expensive. Your tools will determine how deep and sharp of a slope you can cut on the OD of your part. It's also usually good practice to start with one tool, like the CNMG, to remove as much material as possible with a cheap tool, then go into finish with the VNMT. Now let's look at how these concepts apply to inside tool reach. I'm going to warn you ahead of time that when it comes to quantifying boring bars and tools for cutting the inside of a part, it gets very complex and a lot of manufacturers stray from the standard naming schemes. So always be careful when you're trying to select tools. Let's take this DCLNR boring bar and try to cut this nozzle geometry into the bottom of this cylinder. As you can see, the tool didn't even get close to cutting what we wanted it to. So what actually happened? ID boring is very tricky for shapes like nozzles. Ideally, most boring bars are designed to cut just a straight wall on the inside of a hole. Boring bars cannot go into a hole smaller than 2 times F, as seen in the diagram below, and they cannot cut an undercut greater than F. This means that if we wanted to achieve that nozzle geometry we saw before, we'd have to use a much smaller boring bar with a much smaller F value, though that would mean that we'd have to then take more passes, cut slower, and we wouldn't be able to get in and around the curve of the nozzle on the inside. Tools will always have their reaches and dimensions defined in the specification sheets. In general, the closer you are to turning a cylinder or a straight hole, the cheaper or easier it is to find the tools. If you're having trouble visualizing the dimensions and specifications found in the documentation for a tool, the best way to try it out is to go into CAM, like in Fusion 360, design a tool, and then have it try to manufacture your part. It will quickly tell you whether or not that tool is acceptable for what you're trying to do. Let's take a look at these two different nozzle exteriors and see what tools we could use to cut them. So what would happen if we took these two and specifically focusing on the areas surrounded in red, we tried to machine them with a CNMG tool? I can tell you right now, we're not going to get very far into either of them. The CNMG is not made for cutting into these kinds of grooves in and out. Now if we went in with a VNMT, we do get some pretty good results. As you can see, the nozzle on the right, the VNMT was able to get all the way in and only missing a tiny amount of material at the very bottom of that groove, then come out and complete the rest. However, the nozzle on the left, you can see in blue, the angle of the VNMT was not enough to match the angle of the part. To finish this part, we'd have to go in with one more smaller tool, or another VNMT with a steeper angle on the side. A smaller tool increases the complexity of the setup and can also increase the cost to complete a part. Try and complete them with as few and as large of tools as possible. Now did you notice on that previous example that the tool was flipped between the two nozzles? This is called the tool's orientation or handedness. Tools can be left-handed, right-handed, or neutral. The same inserts will work for a left, right, or neutral holder. The orientation determines which direction the tool can cut and what geometry it can cut. 
For example, this set on the bottom right includes a left, right, and neutral tool holder of the same insert. If we had tried to use the opposite handed tools to cut both of those nozzles before, neither of them would have worked. In review, the shape of a tool defines what geometry it can cut. For OD turning, a pointier tool will be able to cut a deeper cut with steeper sides. For IED turning, tools have a minimum hole size they can enter. Tools have a neutral, left, and right hand variant that can determine their cut direction. Let's now look at selecting material and stock for turning. Selecting the right material is always challenging, and there's a lot of factors that you need to consider. As we discussed earlier, machinability is the rating of how easy or hard it is to machine a material. The higher machinability rating, the easier it will be to cut. In general, the machinability rating increases as the hardness of the material decreases, so you need to find a balance between the two. Turning then adds another complex point that we need to consider of workpiece deflection. Turning imparts a lot of force onto our stock material, which can result in the part becoming bent. Sometimes this bending is acceptable and small enough that we don't notice, but when we're making very small or very thin parts, it can become so apparent that the part ends up looking like a banana. A large diameter short steel bar with very light cuts will see very little deflection, whereas a long thin plastic tube with very aggressive cuts might deflect so much it will snap. It's important to consider deflection as you're designing your parts and considering how it's possible to machine it. You can reduce deflection by making the parts thicker, choke up on the part or make it that you can machine the majority of the part with very little of it sticking out of the spindle. Using the tailstock would double the effective length of cutting, which would then have the deflection. And you could take lighter cuts or progressively weaken the parts. This will make the machining time take much longer and will require special consideration for multiple setups. It's your job as a designer to make the part that can be produced with the minimum acceptable amount of deflection. While you can get material in pretty much any size, some are cheaper and easier to work with. Stock is most economically sold in nominal dimensions, so design about 50 thou below a nominal size to allow for some material removal. For instance, instead of making the outside diameter of a combustion chamber 1.25 inches, make it 1.2 so it can be cut from a 1.25 diameter piece of stock. For round stock, this applies to both the OD and the ID if applicable, but usually not the length. If you're ordering stock of a diameter, you can usually define what length it's cut at at the factory. It's important to note that when you're buying long round bars of stock, it's generally cheaper to buy one long length than say four or six short lengths. We can then cut it on campus ourselves to save money. Round stock is usually sold as a round bar, tube, or pipe. Hexagonal and square stock can also technically be used for turning, but round is much more common and easier and safer to work with. The goal of stock shape is to reduce how much material must be machined away. It's also important to note to be careful when switching from one stock shape to another, their measurements can change. For instance, round stock is generally measured by the outside diameter, whereas something like a DOM pipe is measured by its inside diameter and its wall thickness, with no mention of the outside diameter anywhere. So let's go through some example parts and see if a round bar or a tube would be better for each of them. Let's look at this combustion chamber to start with. What do you think would be better, a round bar or a tube? For this application, I would probably try to use a tube. This part has a relatively large OD. If a tube can be found that worked, it should be used. As you can see, we already have a large hole going through the center of the part as well. If the flange at the top could be separated and we can make this in two parts, then an even smaller and more affordable piece of stock could be used. How about this injector? What would you use? For this, you would probably have to use a round bar. While there is an ID to this part, 
The difference between the ID and the OD is so extreme, there's probably no pipes that are available. We'll just need to bite the bullet and drill it out and bore it out ourselves. Like before, removing the flange from this part would save a lot of time and money when it comes to the material selection. Now how about this part? For this one you'd want to use a tube. This part is a very large ID, so there's less starting material there in a tube than there would be in a solid round bar. For something with this large of an ID relative to the OD, a pipe may also work. A pipe is generally just a thinner walled tube. Just like with milling, stock prices are not linear for turning. A 4 inch diameter by 1 inch long round bar will cost a lot more than a 2 inch diameter by 4 inch long round bar. Long round stock is much cheaper than a larger diameter short round stock. Try to design parts that only need long stock in one direction, or split into multiple parts wherever possible. So in review, you must balance multiple characteristics when selecting a material. The higher a material's machine ability score, the easier it is to machine. Parts should be designed with deflection reduction in mind. Stock is available in multiple sizes and shapes that should be considered when designing. Long, thin stock is less expensive than short, thick stock. Let's now look at work holding more in depth for turning. Earlier on, we already discussed chucks and collets, two common forms of work holding. As a reminder, work holding refers to whatever you use to connect your part to the spindle. Work holding must be considered when designing a part. If you can't hold on to a part, it can't be machined. As we said, the chuck is a very common form of work holding that allows you to hold on to the outside or inside of a round part. It's the most common and easy to use work holding option. And chucks can only grab onto straight walled sections of a part. You can't grab onto a taper or a curve using a chuck. Here's an example of using a chuck for the inside or outside of a part. Collets are a good option for holding the outside of a pr precise part that you don't want to damage. The collet must be the same size as the part to work or within a very small tolerance. Just like with chucks, collets can only grab onto straight walled areas of parts. There's not many techniques for grabbing onto the taper of a part, so you need to make sure that your design allows some area to hold onto that's not a taper. If your part is an odd shape or too weak to hold on the diameter, an arbor might be the way to go. The arbor is any part that you put between the workpiece and the chuck or collet. Two common examples of this are bolts and glue. If your part has bolt holes in it that will be used in the final design, it can be held with those bolts while turning. We would manufacture a custom arbor that's easy to hold on in a chuck and then copy that bolt pattern onto the front of the arbor. It's important to note that when you're doing this, you can't really get too close to where the bolt holes are while cutting. If an arbor is required to complete a part, you should design that at the same time as the main part. The same rules for turning apply to designing and manufacturing the arbor. If you have a part that's very light, such as it was cut from a thin piece of plate or sheet, you can use a glue arbor to turn it. The part is glued to an arbor, which is then held in the chuck. Once machining is done, you can remove the part with heat or chemicals. Glue arbors can be very unreliable and are hard to set up properly. They should be avoided as much as possible. In review, chucks and collets need a flat face to hold onto. Arbors can be used if there is a bolt pattern present or the part is very light. You need to make sure you can hold your part when you are designing it. Let's talk now about multiple setups and turning. Often a part will have features that cannot be reached with one work holding option. A part can be removed from the machine and flipped, rotated, installed in a new arbor, etc. just like with milling. When you're moving the part, there's always a chance of misalignment. Related critical features should be designed so that they can be machined in a single step. For instance, it's not ideal to have to machine one half of a nozzle, flip the part, then machine the other half of the nozzle. When you're flipping or changing the work holding of a part, you need some way to re-establish where the tool is relative to the part. 
This point is called the datum. It should be something that was machined in the previous setup that can be measured relative to the features in this setup. Make sure to leave spaces that can be used as datums on complex parts. Here's a cooling shell for a small liquid rocket engine. No two features are relative to each other, so we can do this in as many setups as we want. How would you hold this to machine it? Where would you put the datum between the different setups? I found the best way to make this part is to start by holding onto the OD and boring out the center. You'll also notice in this step that we clean up the front face of the part on the far right. This then allows us to flip the part, holding it on the ID and pressing that machined face up against the chuck face. This gives us a good locating surface to then come in and machine the outside with a left-handed and right-handed tool. In review, many parts will need multiple setups to complete. Features related to each other should be designed to machine all at once. Make sure to leave somewhere to grab onto the part for every setup, and if a part requires multiple setups, make sure there is a datum to reference between them. Let's review some other DFM rules in general. The number one biggest rule of DFM is keep it simple stupid, or KISS. If a part is too complex to be manufactured, it can derail the entire project. We also have a very limited number of machinists at RIT. Taking up their time on an overly complicated part can impact and derail other projects, leading to the entire team suffering a cascading failure. Using unified materials can help to make the tool selection process a lot simpler. For example, this combustion chamber and injector are both made from the same grade and size stock of copper. This means that we can machine the entire combustion chamber, cut it off, move the stock forward, and then make the injector quick and easy without having to switch out tools. Duplicate parts are also a great way to reduce machining time and complexity. Programming a part is about 75% of the challenge of manufacturing it. If the same part can be reused multiple times, or a part from a previous project can be reused, it makes manufacturing significantly easier. For example, the two leaves that seal the bottom of this cooling chamber on the right are identical. We can program the mill to make one, and then just run it again with a second piece of stock to make the other one. Tolerancing determines how well parts fit together, but also how hard a part is to manufacture. Keep your tolerances as loose as possible for your application. This helps to keep manufacturing easier. Changing from, say, a 5 thou tolerance to a 3 thou tolerance can more than double machining time. Creating threads is a very time-consuming process that requires specialized tools. Wherever possible, use pre-threaded components. For instance, rather than threading a plate to accept a bolt, Place a nut underneath the plate and just have a through hole through the plate. When unavoidable, tapping, or the action of putting threads on the inside of a hole, is usually easier than threading or putting threads on the outside of a cylindrical part. Let's now discuss some further learning opportunities to help you become even better at DFM. The three best ways to get better at DFM are to practice, try and fail, and watch others. As we said at the beginning, DFMA and DFM are more of an art style than a science. You need to really try them out, see what works best for you, and gain an understanding of how the manufacturing process works. Watching other people design and manufacture parts can help you get into the machinist mindset and make better and easier to manufacture parts. Here are some YouTube channels that we recommend you watch if you have some free time, they can be very entertaining and you can learn a lot as you're watching. We're now going to begin section 3, Design for Assembly.